and everybody and uh, welcome. Uh, hopefully all of you are tuned in uh, from uh, the Middle East. For those of you joining elsewhere, a either good morning or good evening, uh, depending where you are in the world. Um, thank you for all those that have already joined in uh, on time and early. I know that we've got a uh, relatively tight agenda, so I'm going to get uh, cracking with it. And if those that join in later on, uh, they're more than welcome to do so. Um, once again, I do want to thank you for being here, and I hope that wherever uh, this webinar finds you, that you're staying safe and healthy uh, with family and loved ones. Obviously, there's a lot that's going on uh, in the world today, and we want to make sure that we provide you with some tips on what it means to lead virtual teams. Now, for those of you that submitted questions uh, in the past, I'm, we, some of the content that we have is going to address those questions. Uh, however, you will have another opportunity to do so. And the reason I'm bringing up those questions is a number of them uh, related to uh, requests that can we make this relevant to COVID-19 and what's going on right now. So it's not so much just in general about leading virtual teams, but rather also uh, those of us that got thrust into this uh, unbeknownst or um, un uh, unexpectedly. Um, so just some reminders as we go through this here and uh, uh, we're able to discuss this further. Uh, I want to give you some uh, additional information about the session um, and some of the reminders with regards to that here. The first and foremost is the fact that we're going to take about 45 to 50 minutes and we'll allow some Q&A after that from anybody who has that. Um, so please feel free that if you have any questions, you can submit them as we go along. You will notice that on your uh, webinar, there is a Q&A section and there is a general chat section. Um, we will try to get to, to both of these areas. Um, if you have something that you're addressing to all those people, uh, certainly please uh, do so. I, have a, I see that uh, there is uh, Melanie who had raised her hand uh, for this here. Um, again, I, uh, due to the fact that this is a webinar, I want to try to keep to time and make sure that we answer all questions that, there, that there take place. I should let you know that uh, uh, today's webinar administrator um, and producer is Kaisa, my colleague. Uh, she is on the call as well as a co-host. Of course, she will maintain uh, a mute unless she needs to respond to any of the questions that might be popping up. Um, and there is a question whether or not this is being recorded. And yes, uh, indeed it is. Uh, we had promised those who were not able to make it uh, due to this uh, session being oversubscribed uh, that we will send them a recording as well as the, uh, the docket that you're seeing right here, which is my next point. We will be sharing this slide deck with those that are on the call um, and a recording for those that, uh, that were not able to join us. Um, in addition to that, we'll be sending you what we refer to, uh, to as the top tips booklet, uh, which will have some top tips for virtual leaders in how they can manage further and deal with their team. And as I noted earlier, indeed, this is being recorded as we go along. For those of you that uh, submit the, um, the Q&A, uh, please make sure that, uh, again, uh, we will try to get as many of the questions at the end, but you can always feel free uh, to contact us afterwards. And if we don't get to your question, we certainly will um, after that with a, a direct message or direct uh, email to you. Uh, now, uh, before I jump into this, uh, 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 maybe a, a bit of a humor. If, if, you're, uh, if your dining room currently looks like this, um, I think you might be facing a little bit more challenges than simply how to manage or lead a virtual team. That being said, though, and if some of you are out there telling me, Edward, I'm, uh, I'm completely digital, this is outrageous, this is so outdated, uh, it certainly doesn't look like that. However, your uh, screen uh, happens to look like this, it's just as bad. Uh, so there is chaos within the digital world also. It's not just simply what we find in and around us when it comes to this. And um, while, of course, uh, this may be the case for us, it also is reflective of what are some of our teams dealing with um, and able to manage in, during these times. Now, I want to address the current situation, and not so much, obviously, I'm not an expert by any stretch, but I want to address what it's doing to organizations. The reality is for many of us, uh, this does seem like a new world. Uh, while virtual working has been around for a very, very long time, for the most part, uh, we woke up one morning and we were told work from home and off we went and, and had to mobilize very quickly. So we're dealing in a situation right now where there's a state of confusion. There's a lack of time. Despite we think that we gain more time, we feel like there's just simply not enough time to do everything. Uh, we might be juggling multiple tasks and we're dealing with concerns, either ours or of course our teams, all at the same time, uh, while at the same time we have a sense of this feeling that we're losing control, which is a very critical area that's, that, that's going on. Now, a lot of these are, are very warranted. Uh, this in a, uh, leading virtual teams in of itself is a unique skill set. 
It is not something that we do normally. It's not the traditional way of managing or leading others. Uh, we're used to the, uh, the element of, of having people in that, that physical uh, environment around us, which is certainly not the case right now. More to the point is not just uh, the situation here, it's what we're unable to see behind the scenes that we're, we're able to, we have to deal with, uh, which comes in the form of, um, I'm going to call it the invisible war zone. When we're in the physical office space, that's one thing uh, we've got. We, we can see what's going on. We can see the problems that are happening. Uh, but right now, that's all taking place virtual, and we might still have some nuances and issues between service and sales and production and HR and IT, but it's completely out of sight. Worse yet, we may have gone from what we refer to as a football team uh, with all of us united towards a common goal uh, to potentially now looking like a team of footballers, individualistic in nature, isolated to a degree and unable to engage others uh, that, are, that are in there, uh, that are in our organization. And this is where we have to start to make that change. So based on that, how do we lead virtual teams? What is it that we have to do a little bit differently? And before we start to look at teams, I want us to consider us as individuals, because the fact of the matter is, if change was going to happen, if we were to excel at leading our teams virtually, it has to start with us. And there's a few pointers that I want to bring forward here that might be of great, great help to you. First and foremost, lead by example. And as silly as this might sound, it does, it's something that we're not accustomed to. It's about maintaining great habits virtually. Now, your team may not be able to physically see you, but they can still see you, so to speak. There's a, a sense of kind of behavior, how we are over, over our, our video calls, um, uh, how, what do we look like, what do we feel like, how early are we starting our day. All of these, whether we like it or not, are quite visible to our team members, um, and it is extremely important that we set the tone uh, and lead by example when it comes to that. Just as important, and I think this is critical for anybody really, is self-motivation. Our teams are always looking to us for hope. Um, and effectively, that comes down to for us finding our fire and to stay motivated during uh, virtual scenarios where we, we might be uh, wishing for that, that, uh, that engagement of others and, and so on. So we really have to find what it is that would allow us to self-motivate, to maintain that level of, of excitement within the organization and pass that energy on to our teams. Third area is calendar sharing. For those of you that might not be doing this already, I cannot stress this in, uh, enough. Whether you're using Microsoft Outlook or other, other uh, tools, uh, you have an opportunity to share your calendar outright with your team. And if this wasn't happening properly back then, it should be right now. Every single person when it comes to virtual team management should know where the other is. We should be, uh, we should be filling up the calendar, putting our meetings in there, our conference calls, everything so we feel a little bit more connected and we can track people down whenever that we need them and it makes it a lot easier. Um, this also shows a bit of the activity that's going on um, and that's just as important as well. For those of you that are unsure about this element and, and you need a bit more help, um, we can, you can certainly reach out to our team. We do have a, a, a bunch of tips on, on how to maximize your, your, uh, your use of things like MS Outlook and Exchange and, and what have you, uh, but we'll, this is a, a different topic altogether right now. Personal time. I think it's very important that when we're working in a virtual space and, and particularly in our difficult times right now, we forget that there is personal time and there is business time. Uh, you might find yourself and reports are coming in, longer hours of work um, on the weekends. We're trying to find different times to do that. And while that's perfectly fine, if you like what you do and, and so on, that's great. Um, however, try to find maintain that balance and recharge because your team is going to need you um, around uh, as a leader. Collaborative ecosystems today, that's, that's quite easy to do. Um, I, we still talk to some leaders who are using email as a communication form. They want that, that uh, rigidity or they want that formality. Um, in virtual teams, we need to be a little bit more collab collaborative. We need to reach our people a little bit faster and stay engaged. That means also sharing successes over Teams or WhatsApp or any kind of communication tool that allows us to connect a lot faster in that instant time zone. It makes us feel the same as hopping over into the next door office or the cubicle next to you and being able to share news, be it good or bad, but that's where it comes from. And last but not least um, is time management. And I truly can't stress this enough. I always tell people, think of your time as money. Um, and it's certainly not something that you, you have a tendency of giving it or throwing it away all the time. 
Um, today in virtual team management, we, we lose track of that time. Uh, we might take a little, we think we're taking a little bit more breaks and so on. Um, the the uh, discipline that's required in, in this one here is absolutely critical and it's something that we have to maintain as we go through that. Now, when we jump into virtual teams, I think one of the more important elements that we have to talk about is our uh, leadership style in a virtual world. And really, this can go from two spectrums. There's those of us that go into the full freedom, whereas others that go to the control, and we swing potentially back and forth within that. And I want to keep that in mind. You have to determine the kind of leadership style that you want with your teams that gets the results. Am I the person who provides that full freedom or am I the person who wants to be a little bit more controlling? And there is obviously a happy median in between that. There's actually six styles that we talk about that we have to consider when it comes to leadership. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of these styles. This is more of an awareness of what's going on and then recognizing where you need to be. For some of us, our leadership style is that of an authoritative or a visionary one. Uh, others use what we call an affiliative style. Um, others tend to be the pace setters, that kind of leader, whereas some are the more coach type leader. Um, and then the final two are the democratic leader and the coercive leader. I'm going to bring these up in, in a different context. Um, right now, not only are we leading virtual teams everywhere around the world, many of the leaders that we've spoken to are actually in crisis management as well. And in times of crises, there might be or there's a feeling that we need to be a little bit more coercive. We want things done. Um, similarly, we feel that I'm the kind of democratic leader um, and, and you know, I want, I want to hear from everybody, I want to give them a voice, I want them to vote or whatever it might be. Um, that is a great style. However, in times of crises, uh, that is not necessarily the one that we're looking for. Uh, we tend to lean a little bit more on authoritative and pace setting uh, when it comes to uh, uh, moments of crises. But in general, when it comes to leadership styles, we look at uh, affiliative, involve them. Um, when it comes to virtual teams, we look at, to a degree, setting the pace and coaching. And setting the pace is a very, very big one. Your teams today, those of us that got thrust into this unexpectedly, will be looking for ways to engage further. And they're going to turn to you in order to set the pace. What's expected from work? What do we need to do? All of the different scenarios that are there, uh, they're going to need your assistance when it comes to that. Now, there are some leadership traits that I want to bring up, and you'll understand why this is very important. When it comes to virtual leadership, uh, there is an element that our skills have to get elevated. Um, virtual leaders who are used to this tend to recognize that uh, they respond to the environment before it forces change on them. So they tend to be quite flexible when it comes to that. They're relationship builders. Uh, they're very proactive when it comes to managing and leading others uh, within their business. They tend to be open and tolerant to new ideas, and I think that's a very important element. They, are, they react to change without the rigidity that must we sometimes see, um, and they most certainly defy the status quo when it comes to that. Now, these are very important to remember because virtual leadership can very quickly break down. How does this happen? It happens when we have a variety of problems, and this could come from time, from the level of engagement, business results, the efficiencies that we're looking for, we start to worry a little bit and it starts to break down. I'm gonna put this from the perspective of your people. For some of us, the team does not know where to go. They're, un they're unsure, we haven't been clear with that. There are some that know where to go, but they don't know how to get there. Uh, they're a little bit stuck. For some other teams that we've talked to, uh, they, 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 they do not agree on the ends and the means that are there. Um, in fact, they might not have even identified the challenges that they're facing when it comes to virtual dynamics, the business scope that's in there, what are the results that they're looking for. All of these are critical elements that comes to the potential breakdown of virtual teams. Also, another one is that we do not share the same picture of a situation. Uh, we've got different perspectives about that, and we can't see eye to eye, see eye to eye. And I'm going to address this a little bit later on with some more details as well. And then we have those that simply don't know their own roles and or when and how to contribute. In virtual leadership, things shift, and they shift very quickly, and we have to be able to adapt to all of these elements here. That means recognizing uh, where our team is struggling, and we have to help them out wherever possible, identify those roles and what we expect from them on an ongoing basis. 
Now, I'm going to bring up a concept that we refer to as the effective team clusters. And this is made up of four clusters. We're not going to cover them all. There's, there's simply not much time, not enough time for that. Uh, but I'm going to zero in, pardon me, I'm going to zero in on one particular cluster, and that's the direction cluster. And you'll notice some of the bullets that are up there for you on the direction cluster, and, and this is, is as valuable as ever. Um, it is about the vision that we have in virtual teams. And, and for many of you that might have had experience with this, you're managing teams across a very large uh, uh, space of, of, of countries or regions. Uh, we have to get used to it. And our ability to have people identify with the vision and build our success criteria around this is absolutely critical. But more importantly, it's about organizing our team. And it's making sure that everybody is willing to change instantly. And I think that's as, as relevant as it can be today. And it's about the team overcoming obstacles. So I would urge you as you go through that and you, you plan out your, your virtual scenarios, uh, keep in mind these five elements that I'm about to share with you. If our vision, and I'm not talking about the corporate vision or the, the big picture that might come from the very, very top, but I'm talking about your team vision. And if you don't have one, it's time to look into one. What is it that we want to achieve as a team? What is it that we're trying to drive through? What's the vision? What is our uh, version of the company's vision for my team? And how can I make sure that that continues to motivate? Once we figure that out and that becomes the driving force that fits within the business, these are the five areas that I was referring to. The five areas we look at when it comes to virtual teams are productivity, quality of the work, and this is a critical one. We look at the team or company pulse and ensuring that we recognize where our teams are at. Uh, we've got relationship management and last but not least, continuous learning. Now, I'll address continuous learning later on also because of where we sit for some people and the struggles that we're seeing are simply very, very real um, in the business environment. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. Uh, but for the sake of this presentation and the webinar and the, and the limited time that we have, uh, we are going to be addressing three elements. For us, in order to get that vision going, in order to make sure that business results keep coming in, we need to focus on three areas. The relationships that we have with our teams, particularly in virtual environments, the level of productivity that's taking place, and the quality of the service that we're providing. All these three together, uh, while the five are just as important, but these are the three that we're going to focus to allow us to help us drive through uh, the results that we're looking for. So let's start with relationship management. As the old adage goes that every great relationship has one thing at the heart of it, and that's trust. And it's no different here. In fact, if anything, the need for trust has been elevated dramatically when it comes to dealing with relationships in virtual environments. And we do have, we call it the trust equation. It might be referred to in other formats, but there is an equation to this here. And I want us to reflect on this as we go through uh, over the course of today, what it is that we're talking about. Trust is made up of three elements. It's made up of credibility. It is how we stand or how our team sees us. Do I do, in their eyes, am I a credible leader? Um, have I proven myself to be a credible individual, be it on past experience, be it what I bring to the table? Um, and in, if, I, if I'm meeting my virtual teams for the first time, recognize that we need to build up credibility with them very, very quickly. Um, the second element that we have to look at is, or, or that it makes up that, is what we refer to as intimacy. Um, and this is a very important element that's going on. How well do we know our people? Is there a sense of closeness? Do I know them a little bit more than simply their name and a number and the, and the results that they produce for me? Is there a level of intimacy that's there? And the reason this is important is this is how people generally look at us and, and rate our level of trust. And last but not least is reliability. Being reliable is so important today for leaders and for their teams. And it's not one or the other. We have to prove to our team members in a virtual setting that we are credible. There is a sense of intimacy or that, or that, or that we, we know them well enough. And last but not least, that they can rely on us at all times. If we can hit high numbers, so to speak, in this equation, it ensures that we increase the level of trust between us and them. And without this, we will struggle in, in, in virtual uh, leadership environments. However, those three on their own are not enough. There is an element in the equation that reduces the level of trust, and this is what we refer to as self-orientation. My thinking, my biases, what I'm hearing in the news, uh, other stories that are going on out there that might potentially reduce 
the level of trust that I have in you. That as high as my credibility, intimacy, and reliability is, for argument's sake, we're going to give them each a five out of five, that's 15, but I've got a very high level of self-orientation. I'm self-dependent. I take my opinions to heart rather than others. That might be as high as a five, that's dropping my trust to three out of five. Um, that's the idea behind this equation. So it's very important for us to ensure that if we are going to manage these relationships very well, not only do we work on trust, but we ensure that there's a sense of belonging, that the self-orientation drops a little bit, allowing us to have better relationships with our teams um, and stay connected. And there's an important reason for this, and there are three things to remember. As we communicate and we build these relationships, the first and foremost thing that we have to talk about is framing. And when we frame these, we have to look at things from our team's perspective. In the office environment, we might have a bigger picture. We run across people all the time. Um, we're, able to, uh, we're, we're able to engage other individuals at all times. We're able to make sure that uh, we, we participate in meetings on an ongoing basis. People that we might not talk to, we're talking to, all of these things. But when you put, um, when you put them in, a, in, in their own uh, homes or, or remote offices, they only see a piece of the picture. Um, and, and it might be very easily confused um, if we don't fill that in with other information. So it becomes our responsibility to frame the conversations and the communication. So it's about setting context so that communication lands in the way that it's intended um, and is not lost. It's about using what we call the three Ps for framing, purpose, process, and permission. So when we do communicate to our teams, it is making sure that we provide them the purpose for what we're doing, the process on doing so, and then the permissions that are required. Basically, do we delegate? Do we empower? Um, and what is it that we're looking for? And what do we need in a level of engagement that's there? Um, as the old, again, adage says, one ounce of pre-framing is worth more than a ton of reframing. Um, and that's very important. This is where the relationship falls apart, um, their ability to rely on us or ensure that there's a uh, low self-orientation um, can be impacted by this here. The second thing to remember, and this is what we call is placing or placement. And this is really about ensuring that the team constantly knows uh, where we're at, uh, what, do we have, what do we covered, what do we accomplished, and where are we headed. It is so important to keep that conversation going. Um, and last but not least, and I can't stress this enough, it's presence. It is about giving them your full attention about what's going on here and now. Uh, we can easily get lost when it comes to, to, to virtual team dynamics. Uh, we're not always there and we certainly don't listen intently. And I'm going to bring up or I'm going to share with you uh, what we refer to as the, the, the five levels of listening. And, and if you didn't know or you, now you might be aware, there are five levels to listening. And for many of us, the first level is ignore. Um, this is our own world. Uh, we're, we're, we're doing our own thing. We, we completely kind of block out the world around us. I sense sometimes people when they're on social media or just catching up or they're unwinding, they tend to be in, um, in, in this element here. The second level is what we refer to as to pretend to listen. Um, and this is where we've effectively, we might be on a, on a uh, video call, not this webinar, I'm sure, but on a video call and we tend to pretend to be engaged uh, while we might be uh, in, 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 other, in, in doing other things and really we're just not in there. Um, and then there's that third level selective listening where we tend to multitask. We're on the phone, we're on a video call, uh, we're doing other things, our mind is doing walkabout, but we pick up certain ideas here and there. We're managed to selectively listen and get through that. And then there is the, th the fourth level, which is attentive listening, where we are engaged, in fact. We are paying attention to the other person, which is very important. Um, and then there's that last level, which is empathic listening. And this is the notion of listening with the heart. I would argue that this is probably the toughest uh, level to, of course, achieve empathic listening. And let's face it, I do not expect leaders to, to constantly spend their time in attentive and empathic listening. Uh, we tend to move up and down between that pretend and attentive phase at different times. It's about recognizing where we are and knowing that in virtual dyna team dynamics, even more than, than, than any other scenario, um, it is about making sure that we remain attentive and empathic to our teams uh, when we engage them. So when we are on those calls, we, we really recognize that we are involved with them um, and not simply dismissing them or doing other things at the same time. Now I wanna talk about productivity because this to me is a very important piece. People are struggling, our teams are struggling to stay productive. Uh, for those people that have been in virtual team dynamics for a long time, this might seem a lot easier than, than it should. Uh, but from the outside in, for those of us that are now leading virtual teams, this might be a bit of a struggle and we have to look at it closely. And the first thing I often say is that we have to recognize that 
there is a world of fact and there is a world of feelings out there. There is a bottom line world and there's the beyond the bottom line world. And we have to make sure that when we're managing our team's productivities, we are looking at both of these elements. Yes, we're looking at production and schedules and meetings and what they're doing, but at the same time, we're looking at the teamwork, their innovation, responsibility, some of the commitment levels that are there. That's just as important and we need to engage our people on both levels. So as a leader, there's a few things that we have to keep in mind to make sure that we maintain that level of productivity that's going on. And as much as it ties into the earlier elements, there's a the few things that I want to share with you. And these are, this is, some of this is common knowledge, and, and some of you might be applying this very well already, and that's perfect, which is the video conferencing for meetings. I keep still, we, we, we still, some of our teams get calls from, from leaders telling us, you know, but, but it, what, does it really matter? We're doing it over the phone. We're doing it on, 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 uh, uh, on Zoom without video or WebEx. That's fine. The reality is we need that engagement. And I would recommend if you're not doing this already, you require, when it comes to a virtual team, it's different when you're face-to-face, -face, but you need weekly meetings and potentially daily in some instances, depending on the, 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 the uh, industry that you're in. And for those of us that can use the video, I do urge you to do that. We need that physical presence and that engagement there. Upskill or reskill. I cannot stress this enough today. There's a lot of industries out there are they're now facing a new reality. And, and this is our new reality for the unforeseeable future, in fact. We don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is businesses are starting to look at things differently. They're starting to recognize that remote working does work. Business is moving along. Uh, the need for office space might be reduced naturally. Uh, there is a level of engagement that we can achieve in this scenario and, and with, per, with uh, intermittent meetings face-to-face -face potentially. I'll tell you businesses that will suffer, for those of you that are managing sales teams, for example, there is a new world that's facing them where now they have to run their business and their hit their quotas and their targets and so on in a remote environment, in a virtual environment. So this will require upskilling or reskilling. We have to look at what is it that we're looking to get out of our team during virtual dynamics and where can we make sure that the different skill sets are allocated um, in order for them all to benefit. Um, so it is a very serious area that we have to look at and continue to engage our team with for productivity purposes. Business results. I think too many businesses right now with so much unknown are not sharing their results with what's going on and they need to do so on a regular basis. Uh, the team needs to know where you are and, you, and they need to do the same with you. We cannot expect them to share uh, your, your targets, your numbers, what you're doing, but they're not willing to share, we're not willing to share with them in return. It's a two-way street that has to work that way if we're gonna get the business right. Um, keep them updated. So the out of sight, out of mind is not a good model when it comes to this here. Our team needs to be apprised of any information, what's going on. Um, if you feel it's relevant, if it, you feel it's timely, share it and we go back to some of the talks that we had about this quick sharing. Um, successes is another one when it comes to here. It's not all bad news. When you've got successes in the team, share it and update them very quickly. It helps with morale and motivation. Don't forget to schedule the one-on-ones. Um, again, this relates to the video conference that we're having. We've been seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of leaders, a lot of organizations say they're, they're excited, they're doing a lot of these virtual meetings, but it's all group meetings and we're forgetting the absolute desperate need uh, for that one-on-one -on -one connectivity, um, even for emotionally um, charged conversations, if I can say that, or coaching meetings that have to take place where there might be something that's a little bit sensitive and we have to be able to speak to them in a particular way. So please make sure that you do that. Um, and if I can urge you for one more thing to continue to do for productivity is host coffee breaks and lunches. Yes, you've read that right, and I'm not talking about physical hosting. We do need to maintain the quarantine and isolation in today's world, but even beyond today's world, for those of us that are working virtually, uh, take some time in the calendar and don't have an agenda. Send it out as a coffee break or a joint lunch, and it is amazing what this can do for morale. You are effectively replicating the physical dynamics of an organization, but you're doing it virtually, where people get walk, you know, hanging around by the coffee machine, uh, they, they meet for lunch together, our job or our responsibility as a leader is to make sure that that connectivity is still there. Um, so if we have hung, in with them, hung, hung out with them in the past, we can certainly do so virtually once again uh, by hosting these miniature coffee breaks so we're all aligned in coffee. It's not business talk, it's not, chop, it's not uh, shop talk, but rather purely about um, engaging on a personal level. I'm gonna quickly go through some of the results that we're looking for when it comes to this here. Um, the vision, 
it has to have strategic goals which make that vision come true. It is not enough anymore to simply talk about numbers and bottom line if it's not strategically oriented. We have to break it down so every single team uh, or and individual understands these numbers very well. It gives us clear direction and I can't stress this enough also, create meaningful work for everyone. In times of crisis right now, some of your teams are wondering, what do I do? Where do I go? Um, how is this meaningful? How does it, this lend itself to the bottom line? And I think this is where we come in as leaders to make sure that we provide that clear direction. Everyone needs to understand their role and what is expected of them. Um, we need to see the work in a greater context, as I said earlier. That allows for productivity. Um, and focus on, on the things that matter, I think, is another important one. Uh, we've got to shed some of the other uh, non nonsense or, or, or nonsensical um, information. We've got to align the activities to maximize performance at all levels is another critical area. Now, I, I want to warn you about something. Um, in the office, some leaders tend to be like that, uh, that hawk that keeps constantly coming around and keeping that watchful eye on our team members. Um, while it's a virtual world, that's still possible in the virtual world. Um, too many one-on-one -on -one meetings, so many phone calls, constantly requesting an update. Uh, you're, you're popping on, uh, on their Skype or, or a WhatsApp call or anything of the sort. And, and we're, that, that hawkish behavior that we had in the office um, is replicating itself in, in that environment. That does not lead to productive team members. It leads to extremely anxious um, uh, team members with, uh, and, and with a lot of uh, mental and emotional stress. That's unnecessary and we've got to really be very careful. Uh, we've got to make, create that balance when it comes to our teams. Now, this is, uh, relates to one of the questions that we were posed, which was about quality of work. And, and I'm glad that that came up because um, it is often, often on times when we move from a physical space to that, that uh, uh, virtual space, the quality of our work we feel has dropped. And there's a reason for that. Most people don't understand what's expected of them. We, haven't, we didn't have contingencies on processes, submissions, documents, whatever it might be. Um, as as we, we used to, in the past, we used to show it to a colleague in the office, we used to hop over to a boss or another another department, and we kind of figured out uh, what, what we need to do. We don't have that, 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 that presence anymore, and we have to be able to manage that. There's no luxury of, of, of physical space. We have to deal with that remote environment that's there. And for quality to work, I want to bring up what is probably the most common uh, uh, component of this, is that this... All of what we're going through and virtual team management uh, or leadership is a change for most people. And we've got to recognize where our people are in the change cycle. I don't think people are in denial. Uh, I think wherever you are in the world that you're tuning in today, our, our reality of virtual teams are here, um, is here, it's, it's not new. Um, we've gone beyond the deny phase. However, I think for a lot of people, they're in the resistance phase. And where this comes in is a lot of people are out there figuring, I'm just going to wait this out. Things are going to they're going to they're bound to go back to normal eventually. And that's there lies the problem with quality. We no longer look for ways to improve the work and the quality of what we do because things are going to go back to normal. And I, I can I obviously like anybody else, I don't know when normal is. We're very blessed. We've got a business partner in China where. Um, they tell us that now, uh, 75 or 80 days later, uh, things seem to be slowly, slowly moving along. So there is a new reality there. And our job as leaders is to move people into the exploratory phase as quickly as possible. And to help them do that, we need to set the standard for quality. And, and the, I think the only way I can do this really is talk about uh, maybe a, uh, an example from the, from the Olympics. For those of you that are familiar with, uh, uh, with the Olympics and gymnastics, um, quality is set and, and you know you get a, a score out of 10 and most people are really impressed when you get these high scores fact of the matter is the Olympic standard is 9.4 so for those of us that feel that our work at 9 9.2 8.8 is pretty good out of 10 the Olympic standard standard is 9.4 so these fantastic athletes not only do they that's the, the standard they need to hit to be considered an Olympian uh, but then they get the additional points on, they get a 0.2% or 0.2 on, on risk. Uh, they get another uh, 0.2 on originality um, and a 0.2 on virtuosity, uh, call it that brilliance or that flair. And that's what makes a perfect 10 
at Olympic quality standards. I believe that we have to apply the same thing with our virtual teams. We have to define for them what our expectation is for Olympic standard. That that is the bare minimum. It is not amazing, that standard, because who would not want to be an Olympian in what they do for a living? And the more risk and originality and virtuosity we take, we can achieve that greatness or that perfect 10 that every athlete thrives for. And I think that's very important. And in an organization, nobody can define the quality of the work that you're looking for except for you. Now, I would ask you, pardon me, I'd ask you that when you go through this and you look at these three areas that we talked about, relationship management, productivity, and quality, um, go through what we refer to as the expectations matrix. I would ask you to define how as a business, as an organization, you're going to have relationship management, productivity, and quality set. How will it be set for a team? And how will it be as an individual participant in that? And only when we define these and we figure out the activities, the processes, the tasks, the engagement levels, can we start to achieve better results when it comes to that. Now, I wanna bring up um, another element that comes to this here. And, and these are, um, we tend to refer to them as the three philosophies of business when it comes to virtual dynamics. And honestly, I think it really is com it comes down to managing self more effectively in order to manage others. And I would argue that if we are able to do these and pass these points along to our uh, teams, everybody can certainly benefit from that. And the first of which is results. Every business today is desperate to make sure to stay on track. And there's a lot of businesses that are hurting, whether you're in hospitality or aviation or otherwise, or even manufacturing. Some of our clients are, are in, a, in a difficult situation, oil and gas. If we don't understand what results we're looking for over the coming uh, remainder of 2020, we will struggle to achieve them. So know the goals that you're looking for and determine the tasks that will get you there and only spend time and energy on these tasks. You have to be able to communicate that to your team also. The second area that I would ask you to look into is this notion of overview, structure, and control. It's not out of sight, out of mind, it's insight in mind. And this is more so when it comes to virtual team dynamics. Make sure that everybody understands the structure that's there, what you're trying to achieve, and we've discussed that. Make sure that we structure for success. That means our regular meetings, our goals, our updates to the team, how we engage one another, that structure for business submissions, all of that needs to be figured out if we're going to succeed in virtual team leadership. We also need to make sure that we remain in control of what we do. And the same thing goes for your team members. And I say that because very often they feel that now that we are disconnected or now that we're virtual, I'm unable to pass the baton to my team member in order to make sure that they get the job done. So, so that is a very important aspect that we have to keep in mind, but it is about maintaining control of my time, my presence, my actions, all of these elements. And last but not least is time planning. We've got to understand that in virtual dynamics, uh, there is a different planning time frame. It does not mean that things can go on or lapse forever. It does not mean that I expect people to be available every minute of every day. Virtual teams still move forward in, a, in an environment where I have meetings, we're booked up, um, I'm in conference calls and so on. So the time frame has to be taken into account. Uh, we sense that when it's virtual, I can just send over a WhatsApp, an email, and I expect the person, because we're working from home, we're working from a remote office, the response is quite quick when it comes to that, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, I'm not going to go into the elephant technique. Many of you have heard this already. Uh, it's the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? It's one, one, one bite at a time. Um, and I think this is the case when it comes to our time planning and management, is making sure that we have those tasks, we're able to deal with them one at a time so we don't overwhelm ourselves and make use of the available time. Uh, if, I think if there's anything that's coming out of, of uh, the, the current imposed virtual dynamic uh, is people are realizing they have a lot of time on their hands. Uh, and despite them working from home, they're realizing that the typical interruptions, the uh, do you have a minute for me, uh, interrupts are no longer there. They're coming in digitally, but they're not as, as, as present as, as they would have been uh, when we were, um, or as, sorry, they're not as prevalent as they would have been when we were in the office. So that's another important aspect that's there. If we get this done, the value that comes out of this is it allows us to focus on our priorities and avoid, we avoid the overload that's going on um, and it allows us to allocate the resources. 
And I think this is one of the tougher areas in virtual team dynamics when you're on various projects that require people from all over the world or even your region, but everybody's in different parts of it. Um, the, the allocation of resources becomes just as important uh, for everybody um, else that's going on there. Um, I'm going to pause right now. I know that there are some questions that are coming in, and I do want to open it up to questioning if that's okay. Um, uh, there's a lot, uh, some of them of um, some great remarks, as a matter of fact, uh, that are coming up in there with regards to uh, the positive, you know, empathy, virtual team to victory team. I love that. Uh, thank you so much, Muhammad. Another comment was, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, as a leader, we should change the situation into opportunities. 100% agree. And, and I, I cannot stress this enough. Thank you, Muhammad, for that. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful opportunities uh, that are out there. Um, the reality is virtual team management or leadership has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an operation in North America, I'll give you as an example. Um, and while our office is in New York and in Montreal, uh, North America is a very, very big geographical uh, piece of land. Um, and that makes it very challenging. So. The notion of getting into a virtual scenario with your video calls and meetings and um, even planning meetings that take place from home, all of these are great, great, great elements that are there. Um, I think it's very important to bear that in mind and make sure that we upskill ourselves where we need to. I, I cannot stress this as much as I already have. I would have honest one-on-ones with your teams today. I would make sure that they understand where they might be falling short in a virtual effectiveness scenario and help them excel there. The skill sets they require potentially to, to, to do the same job they were doing three weeks ago and four weeks ago has changed dramatically. That means we have a responsibility to reskill them or upskill them to make sure that they get value out of the work that we're doing and we as leaders benefit as well uh, from what they're doing. Um, I'm going to keep it uh, uh, on uh, uh, right now uh, for any questions that want to come in. I will pause my speaking. I do see some questions coming in. Um, and if there are any, also Kaisa, who's uh, co-hosting uh, and, and administrating, administering this, will let me know if there's anything I need to respond to. Thank you very much for all of the, uh, the remarks coming in. Uh, thank you for the remark on the trust equation. Uh, without fail, yes. Um, I think that's very, very important to apply. It, it's got a tremendous amount of value to it. When we simplify um, our thinking that that's how we actually think, um, uh, that, that's, that, that's how we think in, in, internally. And if we can replicate that, uh, we certainly should. I've got a question that's come in with regards to what could potentially be um, uh, the, the good habits I talked about in the very first slide as lead by example. I think for those of us that have been, been, again, thrown into the virtual world, it's about getting up at the same time every day. It's about following your routine. It's about getting dressed for work. It's about logging in and ensuring that you engage your team even on a virtual basis. It's about blocking your calendar with meetings that make sure that they're accessible to them. It's about managing your time. And as I said earlier on, while all of these, uh, we think it's virtual and people can't see us because we're not on a video, um, it, uh, it, it definitely is, uh, it, it's visible. People know that. They know when we've been on. Uh, they know that when we're engaging them. And it is so important to be able to make sure that that's the case, uh, even, even when it comes to this here. Um, when it, when there's another question that's come in from Karim, uh, how to make sure that we set priorities when it comes to scheduling trainings and development. I think that's a very important element. Today, we are on a needs basis. Uh, one, uh, we cannot ignore training and development without a doubt. Uh, it is extremely important. However, merely a month ago, it was very easy where we had the, the, the luxury of this is mandatory training. We need this for my business, for my work. Uh, but I would like to upskill in this area. It's for my kind of personal needs. That's no longer there. Today, we need to prioritize based on the requirements of the business, based on the reskilling or upskilling. And this is where we go back to those one-on-one -on -one calls that have to take place, the one-on-one -on -one scheduling with, with our teams. We have to find out in honesty, in all honesty, where do we make sure, uh, wh wh where might they feel that they're falling and they need some support, they need some reskilling or upskilling. And that becomes very important. So thank you for that question. Um, how to resolve any conflict uh, from uh, Srinivas uh, with regards to um, uh, what might arise from virtually. 
I think the laws of engagement do not change between virtual and, um, and, and physical. And then by that I mean, um, even in, the, in our traditional world physically, you would not resolve a conflict via email or WhatsApp, you would do it face to face. Body language, non-verbal non communication, uh, the laws of, of uh, uh, disengaging in conflict is, is this, are the same. Uh, you need to be, again, upfront and, own, uh, uh, and honest, um, set, up a, uh, set up a conference call, a video call, and ensure uh, that, that this is taken care of. A great question from Ala uh, about how can I uh, measure the performance of field sales teams in the curfew period. I think this goes back to my point about calendar sharing as well. Um, they need to be putting in every single call that they're making into their calendar. And if for those of you, and I'll speak about uh, uh, MS Outlook, I cannot speak about every, every uh, tool, but for those of you that are on, uh, on, on Gmail or otherwise, but I'll, I'll speak about MS Outlook specifically, you have the ability of, of changing your calendar setting to um, as little as five and six minute segments instead of the traditional 15 and 30 minute uh, slots. That means I can put in my phone calls or video calls with my clients in there. And today, your performance with your field sales team is no longer about how many physical visits they've done, it's about how many virtual visits have they done. Are they doing uh, their, their sales calls? Are they uh, having meetings, virtual meetings with their clients? Um, are they engaging their customers? And I'm not saying to sell alone, but it's also about checking in on our customers uh, making sure how is everything how are they coping with all of this so our performance is going to be based on that um, for some of our clients that we're dealing with on sales effectiveness the results continue to come in um, it's just a little bit different so there's they have to but the reporting is still there um, in order to measure that performance and provide them the support that they might require uh, Yanis had uh, brought up a question on uh, credibility it might sometimes seem synonymous with reliability I do think there is a very different uh, element when it comes to there. Um, reliable, uh, credible talks about your experience and knowledge in a certain area. Um, for example, and I often give a very simple example for this here, um, if I have a friend of mine who wants to, uh, or if, I, if I'm a big movie fan and, and uh, I tell one of my friends I'm about to uh, uh, buy a movie uh, now that we can't go to the theater, but I'm going to rent a movie or whatever it might be on the system, not Netflix, and I'm so excited because I'm a big fan, I want to see it, and this friend of mine says, oh my goodness, absolutely worst movie I, I, I've seen, I saw it the night before, don't, you know, save your money, don't do it. Credibility in my world Will, will be about, does this person, is there, are they credible in the movie world? Um, you know, do they have the knowledge, the experience um, that, that I can trust when it comes to that? Reliability would be based on my personal experience with them, not their experience as a whole. Are they speaking from a sense of credibility or not? Reliability, have they given me advice in the past about something and they were right, therefore I can trust them. And that's where the difference between how credible are we and can people rely on me um, in, in the general sense of the term that's there. Um, virtual means far from reality, Romilda. How can we be virtual and still stick to reality out there? This is a fantastic point. Now, I would ask, in fact, uh, the reality that's out there, we also need to dis disengage a little bit. I think that self-orientation and the trust equation that we talked about is bouncing out of control because there's so many different uh, interpretations of what's going on. As a leader, our responsibility is to, to shape or contextualize the reality that's going on. So I do urge you that, that these conversations that you have, if the reality is difficult, uh, if there are challenges, be honest with your team, let them know. Um, I do think the virtual world, um, even if we go beyond the quarantine, there is a virtual world that's been operating for years. Um, the earliest signs of remote working or virtual working uh, dates as far back as around 92, 93, where as a trend, um, it started to pick up. It didn't pick up big time, but it started to come in there. Um, and then uh, at various times, companies started to adopt it more and more, but not, of course, as we're seeing today. Uh, so there are organizations and teams that have led tremendously well in this format that comes through there. Um, I think uh, there is an anonymous uh, uh, submission uh, with regards to persuading the team uh, to approach clients through webinars, even if they're going to get rejected for business. I think uh, I'm assuming this might be first from a sales perspective or engaging your customer service. Um, if I can be very honest, if you're in a sales environment, rejection is second nature. 
you uh, salespeople would get rejected fit to their face uh, over the phone when this was not happening. So I do think that that really hasn't changed, but you're right in the perspective that some of our teams might be saying, why bother? Clients don't want to talk about this. And I don't think that's the case. I think clients want to talk to somebody. They want to make sure that um, if you're, they're an existing client, that you are looking after them, that you have contingency plans in place, that they're, you're in crisis mode and you're managing it all of this. So they do want to hear you out and make sure uh, that that's taking place. And the rejection is always going to be there. But it's not all about business. I think there's a human element that's going on right now where we have to make sure that we, uh, we engage our people a little bit more um, and we're able to, to engage our clients, sorry, and make sure that we answer their concerns, that we show them that we're there for them um, in these, these, these times particularly. Under performance and, 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 uh, and uh, performance improvement, there's a question that's just popped up here from uh, Daniel. Um, I think that's again another great question and how do you deal with this? Um, underperformance is going to happen in any environment and similar to conflict, um, it's about having a, uh, a video face-to-face -face conversation. But again, the rules of engagement continue to apply. The way that you would have dealt with underperformers uh, or those that need performance improvement in the real world or in the physical space world is the same way that you will deal with this um, in, in the virtual world. That hasn't changed, meaning it has to be fact-based, you have to have evidence, you have to point it out, it has to be timely. Uh, it's not something that you're bringing up that they were underperforming nine months ago. All of these rules still apply and we have to make sure that we were very careful. The rules of engagement are in place for a particular reason. Um, I'm going to take a couple more questions. I'm mindful of the time that's going on. There is a question on uh, from Kareem, how to coach virtually when it comes to meetings with, uh, with the healthcare professionals. Um, interesting you mentioned that. We are literally in the midst of running a program. Uh, we've just gone through the design in, uh, uh, it's based obviously from your question, Kareem, I assume you're in the, uh, in the medical field or healthcare field. Um, we are working with uh, upskilling medical reps on how they uh, will host virtual meetings with the healthcare professionals that are out there uh, based on their therapy area. So there is a, a very critical aspect that's going on right now. Many industries, as I said, are having to adapt and adapt very quickly on how they can turn uh, their business around. They can continue to engage their customers, which uh, in the healthcare industry uh, obviously would be um, would, would specifically be uh, physicians, um, specialists, or anything of the sort. Um, I think this is a, there's another great question from Linda with regards to how do we uh, motivate teams in, in virtual areas when it comes to commercial teams that are used to be outdoors and so on. I think again, uh, I, I've, maybe I, we're, we're very blessed and, and I do pass this on. There are an enormous amount of, of uh, games and online games made for businesses out there. And, and these are extremely engaging. And so really it goes back to the social dynamic. Social distancing does not mean social uh, disengagement. It means that we have, to in, we have to invest in our people's time a little bit better. And that means, like I said earlier in one of the six points, I said make sure that you host coffee breaks and lunches. I would host motivational sessions. A bit of a pep talk, I would put a game, something fun that can be found online, play against one another. It's available. Some of these are available for larger teams. Uh, we're happy to send across some of the resources when it comes to that. Uh, but there is a lot of stuff that can happen, but I, it is a, a very important uh, point that you've, uh, you've brought up um, there, uh, Linda. Thank you very much. I think there's a couple more questions I'm going to take. Uh, transparent with the team decisions, uh, with decisions affecting their financial plans. Um, I, I think this has come up on a number of occasions recently. It's, a, it's about honest and, honesty and transparency. For those of you in organizations, um, uh, Ahmed posed this question that you feel that there's going to be a, a challenge coming up, a financial difficulty, um, all of that, be honest with your teams and be upfront. There's no use hiding this and then hitting them with a, uh, with a shocker uh, uh, around the corner that they're, they were really not expecting. Let them know, uh, make sure that you manage their, their expectations when it comes to that. I think it's very important to, uh, to be able to do so. Um, Another question from Paul, uh, mental health is a, is a big issue in the workplace. How can virtual leaders make new use of their team in coping and not suffering? Again, a great point. Uh, I was very happy to see even our, uh, for those of us in, in this part of the world, um, uh, the government out here has, has, has instituted a program where psychologists and life coaches and so on, everybody was available. Uh, and I think as an organization, as a leader, we have to be very mindful of that and the fact that there is a stress element that comes, comes with that, uh, the mental health, 
Uh, for some, uh, you, you may not see the struggles uh, in, in, in the home environment. For others, whether you're managing a family, you've got, uh, you, you've, you've got other relatives that might be with you and so on, an extended family, you're dealing with children and, and you're, you're trying to cope with all of that. Um, and the inability to step out uh, is, uh, is, is, a very, is a very big element. So as a virtual leader, um, uh, keeping a, a, a meter on the mental health um, of, our, of our staff is critical. They're hearing all sorts of news that's out there, information that may, might be accurate or not. Um, they're hearing from us, or worse, maybe they're not hearing from us and they're unsure. Uh, we have to engage them as much as possible to make sure that we, um, uh, we're able to, to deal with this beyond that. Now, uh, there is this notion, there's a question from Alad, do you expect that the virtual mode will continue even after the crisis? I believe so. I think that there is a new working order uh, or working world that's in place right now. Uh, I don't think it'll be everywhere, naturally. We, we're, we're social human beings and that interaction is important. But I do think this was a bit of a wake-up call for organizations to recognize, can we do things differently? And I think the first few weeks were a bit of, were a, bit of a stumble, but many, many organizations and teams and leaders are finding their groove right now. Um, and they're finding efficiencies when it comes to that. They're working uh, smarter. They're not working as hard. Their time at home is, is, is well allocated. They're getting stuff done. So this could very well be a, a new world order when we move on from there. <clears throat> um, a lot of people that are emotional about the current situation. Again, I, I agree with you. I think these, uh, these uh, emotional conversations are extremely important. Uh, uh, we have to be very honest with our teams. We have to make sure that they recognize uh, some of the stresses that are on there. Um, it is going to be difficult. And it's one thing when it's a week or two or three. Right now, for many places around the world, it's indefinite as a lockdown or quarantine or curfew. So we, we're, we're unsure of how long this will, will last. So I think it's very important that we recognize as leaders, sometimes we are the cause of the stress for our teams. We still want the work. We want to know where they are every minute of the day. That hawk that I put there that used to pop in and out of the office or on the cubicle and we hover over everybody. Um, you need to create that balance between a collaborative ecosystem, a dynamic where you share and you engage versus you control every aspect of what they're doing. That's just going to add to mental illness. It's going to add to stress and anxiety, all of these elements. And that's just simply not very good. And you're going to have to be having a very different conversation uh, should that become the case. Uh, there's a question from Romilda about the duration of virtual work. Uh, can it go on over and over or not? Uh, again, with the same results. I do believe that yes, uh, to a certain degree, uh, we, I, I think this will continue as I said earlier. Um, will we get the same results? I think what's amazing about human beings is we are highly resilient and very adaptable. We have proven that over hundreds upon hundreds and thousands of years and will continue to do so here. I think it's a matter of uh, us taking stock of where our capabilities are, what can we do differently, and, and then moving forward from there. These are really the important pieces that are on there. Um, very good. I seem to, I think, uh, oh, there's one last question from Rajesh. Uh, how would you advise a team to increase credibility in a virtual meeting? I think that, that uh, this is the, um, uh, you know, we see this on social media, but we don't think about it in, in our teams. We tell a lot of our team me uh, members, go to, uh, go to LinkedIn or other resources, find a thought leadership on a topic. And, and they're getting it from other sources. I think as leaders, we have an opportunity to improve our, uh, our learning um, uh, even further to make sure that we, we're, we're, uh, we're able to engage others and we, are, we become the source of information. That's how we build credibility. More so, if we've got targets ourselves or levels of engagement that are required, I think we need to prove to our teams that we're on the ball, that we're getting the results. Uh, credibility can't be bought, it has to be earned. Um, and that can only be done with the effort that goes in there upskilling ourselves and making sure that we constantly engage our team in the right manner. I am out of time. I'm going to share uh, one last uh, piece with you. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes from Pele, uh, the famous uh, football or soccer star, depending where you're from. He said, success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love for what you are doing or learning to do. Uh, with that in mind, I leave you all uh, and, and uh, with this, this, that positive note. Um, I think leading virtual teams, as I mentioned, is a skill set as is virtual effectiveness from your team members. Uh, and I would urge you to make sure uh, 
that you help yourself and help them along as you apply that. Uh, my team and I remain available should there be any questions and follow-ups to this that's here. And as noted at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we will be sharing the presentation as well as a recording uh, in order for you to share it with other team members or other leaders that might find it of, of benefit. Um, again, I wish you everyone uh, all. Uh, I wish everyone to stay safe and healthy. Wish you all the best, and we look forward to hosting another one of these uh, very soon. Thank you very much.